Yes, indeed, verily, seeing that a straying Aramean was my father, Arami Oved Avi, Rabbi Soloveitchik, towards the end of his The Lonely Man of Faith, originally a lecture, towards the end of that meditation on The Lonely Man of Faith, he cites this verse, which of course is also part of our Haggadah Pesach. Uh, Arami obeyed of thee, a straying, a wandering Aramean was my father Abraham. So I'll continue wandering <laughs> then. Uh, only a faith is all about being caught between two ways of relating to the world, to ourself, to the reality we call God. I'd say that to every, about everything. To the reality that we call the self, to the reality that we call the world, to the reality that we call the divine God. Uh, we're caught between. Ne'achaz Basvach is the title of a recently published volume in Hebrew here in Israel. Uh, a volume of selections from Rabbi Soloveitchik's writings. Ne'achaz Basvach caught in the thicket, caught in the in-between. Uh, yes, I think I might have shown you, shared with you sometime in the beginning of uh, our course of study by, uh, you can see the, uh, the ram here. Uh, if I put on the light there, I don't know if you'll be able to see. Here's uh, the ram. Yes. And uh, what can you say? Yes. On the other side, his face is a little bit different. <clears throat> caught in the between. Uh, Franz Rosenzweig says the, pl the soul does have a place, but that place is in the between. And so, uh, Plato, the early Plato, he said, yes, Eliezer, uh, poets, artists are suspect because the emotions, intuition according to the early Plato, the younger Plato, uh, is not a reliable source, basis for knowing, figuring out what's really out there. What's really out there, uh, ontology. Of course, then there's the question of epistemology. How do we know what's out there? Do we know it by intuition, by emotion, by the rational, by reason, the intellect? Do we know it through nature? Do we know it through uh, intellectual study? Do we know it through community? Do we know it through solitude? And then, of course, there's axiology. Uh, what is our evaluation of whatever it is that we think is out there? And however we come to know or think what's out there, what's our evaluation of it? Axiology. Is it, uh, is it good? Is it bad? Beautiful? Ugly? We, uh, is it sound? Is it unsound?
And I, I think uh, much of what uh, you've been sharing, dear Eliezer, in interaction with what I've been sharing, much if not most, I'm in agreement with you as uh, I understand you, as you understand me. We're just in process, all of us here. I think I agree. Very often what uh, perhaps we have some difference about is, as you sometimes say, the epistemology, but I think very often it's more, perhaps more often, it's the uh, axiology. This happens in the conversation between uh, Andre and Wally. Uh, Andre is often saying, uh, well, yes, Wally, I agree. <laughs> Only, then there's a question of uh, you know, what to do with what we agree. Uh, not only the epistemological question, how do we know? So, for example, yes, I agree that uh, the task, the challenge of education, as I understand it, as I experience it in theory and practice, involves an impossibility. Involves an impossibility. So, I agree with you about that. Wally. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. I agree with you. Only, what's wrong with that? <laughs> I mean, should education strive? I mean, would that be education? As you yourself said to, 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 to uh, the prefix E, X, to take one out, to lead one out, to invite one, to usher one out. Lech lecha, depart, say, tzadi aleph, say me itztagni nutzulcha, the drashic expression has it, to Abraham actually, dafka. Leave, take leave, depart from your uh, astrologizing, <laughs> attributing influence from the stars, from the constellations on our lives. The universe, the constellations aren't there for us. It's not about us. They're not burning, they're not glowing. They're not shining for us, as the Israeli poet Don Puggies, a professor of medieval Jewish Hebrew poetry, puts in one of his poems that starts with uh, that phrase from the Midrash, like opinions, the Midrashic imaginations. I say in the plural, because right, the Midrash says, there isn't, the Talmud says, Judaism says, that it's not monolithic, there's many voices. So, take leave of uh, The possible. I mean, what education is about, going out from, is about, and yes, it's, it's basically impossible. But isn't, I mean, everything that's really worthwhile, that's most important, that most matters, rather impossible? One can never get it right. Relationships of all kinds. Never really get it right. Just work at it. And uh, there are partial victories, achievements. We lose and we find and we search and what we search for evades us. We evade it. This is a theme in my, actually in Myra Kalman's work. I just recently saw a, uh, a film, an Israeli film, a documentary called uh, Salmaniyah. 
based on the word photography, salam, image, matzlema, salam, a photographer. It's about a photography store that was founded and uh, started in 1940 in Tel Aviv by uh, a German couple, German Jews, came to live here. And they were photographers. And uh, they started this uh, photography store. They started taking pictures of Tel Aviv in the 1940s and collecting pictures, photographs of uh, the city, everyday life in the city, uh, architecture in the city, and uh, historical events as well. 1948, the Declaration of Independence in Israel at the, uh, what was it, the Tel Aviv uh, Art Museum in Tel Aviv. And uh, very quickly it became famous, uh, the store. Everybody came to it for as an archive of uh, photographs that they could buy. Uh, and indeed, all over, over the world, in, in Europe, in Germany, in the uh, Netherlands, etc. Everybody, France, became you know, aware of this, uh, of this place as a cultural resource. And the film takes place after uh, the husband of the team has died, and uh, uh, the wife of the team uh, is still alive, something like 96. She ends up uh, dying uh, several months after the film was completed. It's a story of how, uh, of the relationship between uh, this woman and the store, uh, and, and, I mean, really, this woman and her uh, grandson, uh, Ben. Uh, how sensitive, he's in his 20s or something like this, maybe 30. How sensitive he is towards her uh, in uh, helping her in her uh, in these years of '96 and the difficulties and challenges that presents. And in the store, she continues to run the store with his help. And uh, as happens in all cities like Tel Aviv, uh, all kinds of buildings of historic value, architectural value, cultural value, uh, comes down as they build the new uh, buildings, architecture, places. And so they petition the city, uh, whatever committee was involved, that in the new, uh, whatever it was, apartment building or a mixture of apartments and stores that was going to be built on that place, in that location, that there should be set aside uh, in that same place, uh, about you know, the same size uh, place for that store, for that shop, because it really was a you know, historic a cultural a site. And they succeed. Uh, at a certain point, they get a notice that they have to leave the store in three months. It takes about two years uh, for the building to be completed. And we see the building completed, and we see Ben uh, helping his grandmother to uh, decide where she wants her kind of place, where she's going to sit in the store and work in the store. He says, well, the counter is going to be here for the customers, and you could sit over here, or your place could be over there, your workplace corner. And um, it's a story about this relationship. And she has a wonderful chokhmat chayim, uh, wisdom about life. She doesn't beautify uh, reality. She goes with it as it is. At a certain point, she says, oh, it's going to be difficult, the transition. There's a lot of work here to you know, move the store, uh, take everything down, store it, and then you know, re-establish uh, re, uh, it in, the new, in its new place. In its, in the new building, the new building complex, and uh, and he says, uh, uh, "Do you have the strength?" And she says, "No, I don't have the strength." Amli koach. He says, "Eshlach koach." She says, "Amli koach." And he says, "Oh, so you mean I'm going to have to do this myself then? You're not going to help me?" She says, "No, I'm going to help you." And he says, "But I thought you said." that you have no strength. And she says, Bli <laughs> koach. 
Is that wonderful? She says, yes, I know, I said, that's correct. Without strength, I'm going to help you. We're facing all the time impossibilities. But we take them up anyway. Education is a, uh, how I would think how everyone would understand it, but certainly the way I do. Even what I've set for myself as I understand this course of study that you've joined me in, that I'm joining you in. My ideas of what it's all about involves, I think, uh, an impossible, as you have said, risk, risk taking from your side, you and your colleagues who have joined me here in this project, in this course and course, and from my end of it. I have to risk everything uh, in order to achieve anything significant. So I see it. As I, and I've suggested uh, that's my model, my understanding. Van Gogh also has to risk everything uh, to paint what he must paint. If he doesn't sell any paintings, so he doesn't sell any paintings. I mean, that's not his goal, is to sell paintings. I mean, <laughs> he has to eat. Uh, and it would be nice on some level. But uh, Theo makes sure that he uh, is able to eat, <laughs> pay the rent, whatever has his materials to uh, do his work. I, I want to I want to come back to this you know question of uh, axiology vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know another uh, most sensitive and intelligent. A response, uh, Eliezer, to, uh, as you call it, yes, my second video of this week about my uh, book, uh, as I call it, my little book for the uh, Nimrod the Yaniv when they became Bar Mitzvah a couple of years ago. Yes, I think, uh, so I agree with you. Uh, we violate when we translate one culture, tradition, religious tradition, civilization, to another, when we bring them into some sort of conversation. A question that I'm violating a Buddhism in the way I take it up and talk about it next to Judaism. But that's all translation, I think. Again, axiology, how do you evaluate that act. I mean, I think it's a necessary act. There's no way of getting around it. Now, I agree with you also that there's a lot that is different. When it comes to Judaism, in comparative perspective with Buddhism. Of course, again, one of the difficulties here is that neither of these, Buddhism or uh, Judaism, are monolithic. And Judaism, again, according to whom? <laughs> according to what perspective, what, what stream within Judaism, what direction or directions or combination thereof? Oh, combination bringing into conversation the between. We're back to the between. I am anyway. And you see, again, I think, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by deconstruction. But Myra Kalman also is drawing from diverse sources. Her aesthetic relative to small things like uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's uh, architecture, the, the, you know, as an architect when he built the house for his sister, the radiator, the small details, the uh, door handles, the door hinges, 
she finds great beauty in all these simple things. So this this I have, is a theme that repeats throughout the book. I'm not sure how uh, Jewish, I mean, again, I would say, who's Judaism? I share with people a whole course uh, of study on, uh, I call it uh, uh, Art and the Jewish Experience, or the you know, Jewish Experience. Do they go together? Aesthetics, art, visual art, and Judaism, which approaches within Judaism, or there's some tensions. There's a real eclectic, but also a cultural eclectic tradition. I mean, she's drawing from Western translations, notions. Here, I don't just mean translation, of course, from one language to another, from Sanskrit or uh, Chinese or you know, uh, Japanese Buddhism into English. You know, I mean, but I mean culturally, civilizations to translate from. Greek to uh, Jewish, rabbinic, as uh, Emmanuel Levinas goes back and forth between those, seeing differences and challenges, as well as something one can converse back and forth concerning which one can converse in common. And that each has partial take on reality and something to offer uh, each other. I'm just spelling out these uh, betweens. These, the plurality, the plural that we draw from all cultures, all traditions, and have not been uh, insular. As I mentioned uh, in the first uh, this video, uh, that I called, uh, I don't know, what is it, uh, uh, all over the place. Whether it's Shaul Lieberman or uh, Daniel Boyerin or others, the notion that uh, the evidence that we wouldn't have Talmud without the drawing upon certain classical Greek theories and practices of uh, intellectual discourse, exploration, like teacherism, studentism. We wouldn't have Jewish mysticism without drawing upon Gnosticism, without drawing upon Sufism, yes, Islamic mysticism perhaps some other sources. Certain biblical themes, narrative and legal directions are heavily drawn from other ancient Near Eastern cultures, especially Mesopotamia. The Hebrew is a Canaanite language, essentially. Often the interaction is one of uh, divergence, of disagreements, of radical departure, and innovation relative to whatever surrounding culture. tradition that civilization that was uh, drawn upon. But uh, more often than we're usually aware, and perhaps some of us comfortable to acknowledge and uh, encounter and face, think about, uh, 
uh, richnesses, sensitivities, ethical and spiritual, uh, that are part and parcel uh, of uh, ancient Israelite Hebrew biblical uh, treasures. Kol hadrachim bechezkat sakana is a wonderful phrase teaching in the Talmud. All ways, all ways are, all roads, kol hadrachim bechezkat sakana, all roads are fraught with danger. Not to translate so we don't violate. But we must translate, and we do necessarily, as Rosenzweig, that passage I shared with you by Rosenzweig. We are always adding ourselves to make sense of anything. Each one of you are violating what I'm about. But if I don't want that to happen, then I just can't say. I shouldn't be making videos or saying anything. <laughs> I shouldn't be writing, publishing, or teaching if I don't want what I'm about to be violated or distorted. But then, of course, there will also be no, <laughs> no one will reach any sort of understanding. Someone can repeat and be safe and just repeat what I say and uh, not add of themselves. I mean, again, if, as if that were possible. But the attempt, if one can attempt that with a significant degree of success, this would be a very, uh, yes, questionable success. <laughs> because what you would have, I mean, Harold Bloom at the uh, literature, English Literature, Comparative Literature Department at Yale, calls it, you know, there's a difference between repetition and interpretation. I mean, if we enter into interpretation, we enter into distortion. We enter into what he calls misreading. So these are some thoughts. That's not the end of the conversation. Continue. I want to speak to the uh, Edward uh, Tufta's uh, critique of the PowerPoint. And of course, it's not just PowerPoint. I mean, it's any slideshow, really, that sort. In some sense, it's any presentation. It's a movie. It's a book. It's a course. And this is always with any presentation or rep representation especially when it thinks it's a real representation without representation. That's all. That's what we just said. Every It's another way of saying every uh, grasp, every understanding of anything involves what Piaget, Jean Piaget, the Swiss psychologist of so-called cognitive perception, he says two processes go on simultaneously. One he calls... Uh, uh, assimilation. We assimilate what we're taking in, even visually. I see this. Uh, yes, I see this lamp. Uh, well, I already am familiar with it, the lamp. Yes. But even if I was seeing it for the first time. Yes, or this chair. No, I can see. Can you see this chair? No. 
is a picture of it. A drawing I made of it. Uh, when I see it for the first time, I mean, is it a high resolution, two dimensional photograph? You know, flat. It's got a bat, something holding it up in the back, or is it three dimensional? You can sit on it. And that's something that we. That's simple perception. But it's not so simple. Says Piaget. We're not passive. We're actively. Our minds are going are actively trying to figure that out, Let's figure it out quickly. Yes. And um, well, so we assimilate the intake to what we already know. But simultaneously, says Piaget, we also accommodate ourselves, what, accommodate what we're taking in. I mean, accommodate what we already know. I mean, to what we're taking in. But in other words, accommodate meaning, I mean, we we have to alter a little bit what we already know. We have to be ready for some surprise. Sometimes, you know, we see somebody, uh, I'm here in Jerusalem, I see somebody from Boston, you know, from a bit of a distance on the other side of the street. Oh, what's Marilyn doing? Uh, she didn't tell me she's in Jerusalem. Or when I was in uh, Harvard, uh, in Harvard Square, ah, there's a loan. I'm in the subway waiting for the, you know, the car to come. Oh, what he's doing here? I see him from the back. So I walk up to him. I slap him on the back. Alan, alone. What are you doing here? He didn't tell me you're here. The guy turns around. It's a complete stranger. <laughs> what happened? What happened to the simple perception? Well, I guess Piaget would say that there was too much assimilation going on there. <laughs> you were assimilating to what you already know, you know, the intake of what, what, you, what was coming in, the information coming in. I mean, unconsciously, you were thinking about friends in, uh, in Israel when you were in Boston. You missed them. Or well, now vice versa, <laughs> I'm in Jerusalem. And so that kind of took over the perception. You have to have accommodation too. I mean, you have to have both going on at the same time. So, even simple understanding involves a kind of, uh, I have to add to it. Uh, and you get an approximation <laughs> of what's really out there. So then you might say, well, but then you don't have a violation of it, you know, of what's out there, or else you miss. You miss, you truly misread, <laughs> literally. Uh, you're mistaken. But again, that may be with simple perception, uh, relatively simple. But when we get beyond that, uh, to more complex uh, and involved and rich questions and ideas, experiences. Uh, Really, uh, to make them our own, to, have, to, to bring about a situation where we gain some real, genuine understanding. Many will argue that this can't just be mere repetition or copying or getting it right, but really it involves some version of what's going on that in part is filtered as conditioned through uh, my particular being. Any slideshow, whether it be PowerPoint or whatever, Tufter argues, involves uh, passivity. Uh, it tends to involve passivity, it tends to involve oversimplification such that uh, kind of the law is laid down and there isn't much you can add to yourself. You're not really invited. There's not much room to add yourself. It's rather uh, totalitarian and dictatorial. But Tufta himself says, well, people are going to use this. So we have to see, uh, are there ways to 
militate against, uh, to uh, work against these tendencies. And so uh, Susan and others who have been raising these questions and been engaging sensitively uh, this question of PowerPoint and slideshows. Uh, yes, there's a role uh, for, for that, for sure. As I say, it's the same with a book or with a course of study or with a, a movie or whatever. But the question is, can we, can we recognize or recognize that uh, there are ways to write books uh, and share with others in a course of study or via a slideshow or a movie where the reader, the student, or the viewer, the beholder uh, is not uh, left as a passive onlooker. And so we can look to Tufta to make such suggestions. You can do a search engine uh, online and we can find critiques uh, along the lines of Tufta's critique. But then, in the light of that, suggestions of how, yes, what can you do how, uh, with a slideshow which uh, draws people's active participation into the process. And then there are various suggestions. We can figure those out. I mean, we can figure them out ourselves, really. It's not that uh, complicated. But, uh, I mean, one of them would be not having just everything up there or right here with me in the video. Uh -huh. But how to uh, represent, as I say, <clears throat> Representation is not just representation. It's not just making exactly the thing present as it always is and will be, but it's to represent, which involves some change. Some point of view is always going to be involved. And then, how can I evaluate that? What can I do with it? What's the role of my adding my point of view? But again, in an interactive way, in a relational way, such that I'm not just going to end up with the same point of view, my point of view plus my point of view plus my point of view, I plus I plus I, rather than I and thou, I and you. So there I am again in between. I don't want to just be jello, have my mind be jello, just... Uh, you know, a blank blank slate or something. I mean, if, even if that were totally possible, right? We would say it isn't. Or should I, you know, I mean, I have to assert what I know, and I also have to sacrifice what I know at the same time in order to truly reach some, I think, understanding of significance and of value to me and to others. Uh, Jerome Bruner, the educational psychologist, my favorite of his books is a little volume called Essays for the Left Hand. Jerome Bruner uh, has a phrase that I love very much, going beyond the information given. You know, I've, I've jotted down a bunch of thoughts of what I've wanted to share with you. But you can see it here in my very clear handwriting. <laughs> You say, going beyond, yes, <laughs> going beyond the info given. And you can recognize, perhaps, that uh, I've been trying that <clears throat> with varying degrees of uh, <clears throat> achievement uh, since uh, the get-go in our course of study, since the silent teachers, right, where I didn't say anything, or at least not uh, verbally, I mean, in other words, with voice, I would write it down on the blackboard or whatever, but mostly show objects, show rather than say, show rather than say, show rather than tell, 
It was a show and tell. The way show and tell is tell through showing. Not through talking. And so I've been, whether it's from that or whether it's a, a think sheet, the small group work, or really anything is going beyond, is an attempt to go beyond the information given. In other words, can I, well, I don't like to hear the word, I mean, this does not resonate for me, uh, doesn't speak to me, uh, information. But if we change it, going beyond the ideas, <laughs> the idea experiences, as I call it, with a dash, I, one, more, one word, kind of making it one word, idea experiences. how to give a little bit of what it is one wants to share from which others can generate, can develop more. And some of the more will be what you have in mind and some of it won't be. <laughs> They'll take it even in other directions you didn't anticipate. This is good. One of the criteria for, uh, one of the criterion out of all criteria, out of many criteria, for good art, according to some, is that there's some sort of in-between interaction between control and serendipity. That whether you're working with watercolor or whatever the medium, you want it to reflect control but also serendipity, letting things happen with the water, letting things happen with the water or whatever, you know, and the color, water color. I don't know what would be some examples that uh, hopefully would be right around me here from my own work or the work of my students, but mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, this is one of the criteria I think for a good art. I don't know if we can see it in uh, picture. Not enough light here, really, and that's not a close enough. That's not a close enough view. But you yourself uh, think about it and look. This is. Here's a picture I drew at Kibbutz uh, Magan Machael recently. I don't know how bright this is going to be, how dark. It's some uh, Rakafot, cyclamens, and some other wild flowers. And we can see uh, control. But also, uh, here's a large version, another another version, another drawing of uh, the cyclamens, the rakafot, with the very distinctive, yes, uh, leaves. So I don't know here if you can identify, if you can see some things happening, or I'm making marks on paper and using a number of media oil crayon and gouache watercolor and it's the stuff that I've just let happen as well as the control it's the combination that uh, leads to something which is moving to us for some reasons some maybe even this blue in here I mean, I, that wasn't really very planned. I mean, it's not, not, nothing looks that blue, you know, in a leaf, in that leaf. But, you know, or here, the smudging almost, or the, I don't know, what something happens here, which is, uh, I don't know, involves some sort of depth or variety that strikes us as 
more real. The kind of, what does it mean? A play of light, a play of color, a play of shadow and light. Play means, again, between uh, various, among uh, a number of elements, phenomena, interacting. So, there's the between again, and the interaction of offering uh, some information, some ideas, some part of the experience that you want to usher uh, others uh, into, considering, into a relationship with, but from which, you know, they might generate Ah, there, the analogy with the serendipity was that in educational planning, in curriculum planning, how to, yes, uh, as you said about my book, my little book, the Bar Mitzvah Boys, Young Men, uh, Eliezer, compared to Myra Kalman, that mine was very director, directed, you know, very, had a certain idea I wanted to get across. Um... So it is very directive, and yet uh, I wonder, it seems that uh, the two young men and their families, people, others who have seen the book, uh, there's something in it as well that resonates so that uh, each person finds something in it which is a little bit different. I mean, Myra Kalman is also very uh, directive. Uh, she's not just all over the place. Uh, there's a beginning, middle, and end as all well. Uh, and again, there's multiple influences from multiple cultures and traditions that she's drawing from. Only uh, sometimes she, more than sometimes, she mentions them. This is something from my Jewish Russian background. This is something from my Jewish Tel Aviv background. This is something from my American. This is something from the aesthetic. This is something from the ethical. I mean, she kind of will more or less point that out, but very often she's not. And so, uh, again, there's distortion and violation all over the place. But I'm more upfront about it. I would uh, also share one other thought, that uh, in part I'm sharing the personal. You said it's highly personal. Well, hello, <laughs> this whole, every offering all this course is highly personal. And so my message to you is, that I think that this is missing in Jewish education. It's, uh, you're not just teaching Judaism. You're, we're teaching takes on Judaism. Rabbi Soloveitchik is great because uh, you know, there's a particular distinctive take that is uh, conditioned through his personality, which we, many of us recognize in our experience, and then others will be drawn more to another Jewish teacher or philosopher because, uh, you know, the roots of the, your soul, of their soul, is uh, closer, uh, you know, to that particular teacher's uh, mode of experiencing uh, Judaism and life and uh, what Judaism offers, uh, says it takes on, on what we call life. So th think about, can please consider some of, some of that. Uh, but as I say, uh, so the slide show that it isn't just be over there. Give people a copy of one of the texts that you're looking at. Also, is there a way the slide show can be stopped and people can, you know, at a certain point, and one of the slides can say, let's now turn to one another, <laughs> you know, here around the conference table, uh, or the conference room, or even if it's a huge lecture hall, let's turn to, you know, the one or two people sitting next to us, uh, and you know, engage the following question about this. And engage, uh, here's a different view than the one we just, you know, or here's, uh, uh, do you want to go down this path of this aspect of the, uh, 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 of the issue we're looking at, the question we're looking at, or do you want to go down there? Choose one of them, turn to your neighbor, and let's uh, you know, discuss that uh, for a few minutes. And then we'll all come together again and uh, see what happens with the, uh, the next uh, slide, uh, which will have music or image or words. 
So, uh, yes, I wanted to share, uh, to open that uh, up for, for you and with you a bit. Well, uh, Myra Kalman, I mean, what is there, you know, to add? But uh, again, as I mentioned and uh, I shared with you in uh, the discussion forum uh, a few days ago, uh, yes, try out the method, uh, her method of uh, uh, bringing together words and uh, pictures, images. But appreciate also, uh, consider her philosophy of life. And to what degree does it jive with yours? And how would yours be similar? And how would it be different? Would it be personal? To find the personal, I think, is, is really key, is really critical and vital uh, for great Jewish teaching to happen. Jewish education, experiential education, will mean to speak to the experience of our students, whatever age they are, of our fellow human beings, of whatever age they are, with whom we're going to uh, share and collaborate in one another's, uh, one another's expansion of our human, Jewish human spirits, me and theirs, and by, through that, theirs will, will yours, will, you'll be collaborating, you'll be affecting, you'll be expanding mine. Uh, as you have been, are, and will continue to be for our remaining uh, some, what is it, five meetings, four or five meetings. My spirit is expanding in interaction with you. So, uh, to bring something distinctive, uh, to bring Yes, to offer a translation, a translation, a take on what Judaism has to offer uh, that isn't a bunch of nonsense. What nonsense are you teaching your, you know, are you telling your students? But that can resonate as true to us. So, I mean, mainly this is going to come from me, as I say, with the model of being go or whatever, because, I mean, I have to. Uh, it's burning within me, like Jeremiah, what I know, uh, what I think I know, the truths that uh, uh, have moved me tremendously and that I want to share with others. But also, I have in mind who the others are. And, you know, today, young people in uh, the secular Though they go with their parents, they celebrate the holidays as part of uh, Israeli secular, but they're not just secular. They go to a conservative Masoreti regularly. They're going to be in synagogue uh, for all the holidays, and, uh, and the holidays are in their home, uh, the uh, Friday night uh, Shabbat table and all of this. But they're also modern uh, secularists in some significant ways. Uh, and uh, they know, they hear, they hear there are other religious traditions. And there's Buddhism, and there's differences, there's some strange, strong differences with some certain approaches with Judaism. But with certain approaches within Judaism, I think there's some similarities too. And this is not something to be, uh, you know, anathema to us according to some approaches uh, to, uh, uh, to Judaism, such as the Rav Kooks, Avram Yitzhak Wayne Kook. Chaviv Adam Shaniv Rabbit Selim. Precious, beloved, is all human beings created in the divine image. And the Rav Cook says, oh, well, in order for the, so you really be able to fulfill that, you've got to study also different cultures and even religions. And don't think any religion outside of Judaism is somehow, you know. Uh, so we know about that. I put Shakespeare next to. Bible, very often. I mean, to me, again, I'm in the in-between. But, uh, again, whether it was the mystics or Maimonides, uh, everyone was drawing from, from 
cultures and civilizations and religions that were philosophies uh, that were next to them, that were you know where they that were what was happening in their time and place. Uh, and it didn't just mean agreement or adoption, but there was a kind of adaption uh, which went on. Uh, but I think educationally also, or psychologically as it were, I mean, when we do think about who, to some degree we do, who is the student, then I think that if Shakespeare and if Buddhism, even if it's only vaguely so, if it's valued by uh, the persons with whom we are entering into uh, collaboration in, the, in their continuing development, then to the degree that uh, major directions in Jewish religious civilization, tradition, theory, and practice are not valued, are not appreciated, uh, if we can put it next to something that is, then very often this can open up for people. Say, oh, I mean, these are similar questions that Judaism thinks about too. Uh, so maybe I can hear that voice. Uh, maybe I can identify and uh, search and research and learn more about uh, concerning in relation to. So, you know, the, and so the Myra Kalman is wonderful. Sometimes when I imagine my own death, she writes, I believe I'll be reunited with my loved ones. We are all floating around in a fluffy sky. And she shows it <laughs> above a, <laughs> a donuts <laughs> stool. I get a delicious, cozy feeling thinking about how, yes, after I die, I'll be reunited with my loved ones. But then I remember that even my loved ones are sometimes very irritating and even infuriating. So what is that about? And what would we do all day forever? And she's doing it by raising these questions and by humor. But she's very didactic. She's very clear that, I mean, this is really rather ludicrous, an idea that we're going to be visiting, that we're going to be reunited with our loved ones after we die. Uh, complicated, the whole question of Sherut, Sherut, Tanefesh, what remains after life of my Steve consciousness or something. There are different views within uh, Judaism, Judaisms. Yes. Besides, the whole thing is insanely unlikely. I prefer the notion of heaven on earth, of sweet, funny, loving moments. And by the way, I just was uh, studying this here in the apartment, in my apartment, with our every other Monday uh, night so-called shiurim, that people come and join me here. In uh, Nefesh HaChayim, Rabbi Chaim of uh, uh, Voloshin, middle of the 1700s to uh, the beginning, the middle-ish, almost the middle of the 1800s in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. And uh, and here's the Nefeshach And here in part one, chapter 12, he talks about how the world to come, Olam Haba, is actually yeah, is actually not a place after death. <laughs> it's a place it's not a place, it's not a physical place, it's a consciousness of one who becomes a ben olam haba through 
the life of Torah and Mitzvot. The Chachma, Maimonides adds. Living that life, that kind of life, one develops a certain consciousness. How does Herman Melville put it? You've talked about that, Eliezer, with sensitivity and intelligence. That being what's really real is the divine, not this world. But this is also not, this is true and it's not true. As so many, I mean, really tough and beautiful ultimate issues, questions, realities. It's true and it's not true. Because this is the life of, of mitzvot, of Torah of mitzvot, is in this world. So this world is awfully important. It is awfully real. Without it, lo hametim ya hallelujah. The dead can't praise God, can't uh, make sacred, can't honor, can't. So the commandments are every day. The every day we love the every day. Rosenzweig. This is central to the star of redemption. To remain in, he says, to remain, to stay in this world, in the every day. But as Herman Melville puts it in Moby Dick, to be in the world without becoming of it. And I mean, you know, she doesn't beautify life. She has here, uh, yes, people that Stalin, many of whom were Jews, uh, murdered. And, uh, yes, she has, uh, my sister and I go to Israel during the short, furious, the world is doomed war for a wedding, because you cannot postpone weddings in dark times, especially in dark times. This one, she doesn't have a picture, she, you know, she, especially in dark times. That's like, uh, yes, Ben and his uh, grandmother. Do you have the strength? She says, no. Ah, so you're not going to help me? Uh, I'm going to do it myself? Uh, she says, no, Lee Koach, no, I'm going to help you. I'll help you even though I have no strength. I'll help you without strength. He says, because you cannot postpone weddings in dark times, especially in dark times. Who knows when the light will come on again? Are things normal? I don't know. Does life go on? Yes. It's wonderful. Yeah. And, um, and so, indeed, you know, life goes on. Here she shows a man dancing on salt, which I take to mean it's a wonderful picture. How do you balance the impossible? <laughs> How can you balance balance between, I mean, in impossible situations? Ay, ay, ay. Then, you know, here is the man. His hat flew off his head. I hope he is not really dead, just enjoying a refreshing lie down in the snow. But the caption says, <laughs> you know, he is dead. She says there are sad things in life. There are sad things. An awful lot, she says. I mean, you know. Everything can't be, we say, some people prefer the philosophy of life. Well, but there's a meaning, everything is for the best. And, you know. I mean, there is this, the book of Job. And in the uh, Megillat Esther, Eliezer, yes, there is uh, that line which is chanted with the chant of Echa, of lamentations, about Mordechai, you know, being one of the exiles. Esther being an orphan. We're all orphans. God doesn't change. Okay. But uh, we're not God. We're humans. And uh, you know, our situation can at times be 
difficult, even horrific. How not to lose our heads? Yes, we don't. We mustn't lose our heads. We, or we, we, I mean, we, we say we mustn't. We have to help one another as best we can. Wonderful, Myra Coleman. And how, remember, we already shared the, uh, she calls it courage, flowers. This is a painting of a photo taken in London in 1940. It's a library that was bombed in the Blitz. Remember, we looked at that already. And how after the bombing, the people immediately come back in the wreckage to the books. Does that, does that make sense? That's impossible. The bombing could then continue, you know, again. But... Oh. Here, she says, this one, precarious, impossible, very often, our situation. I am at a loss for words. Everything was not said. Things are bittersweet, bitter, sweet. What is this faint vision, this fleeting memory? The furniture is so fragile, and the dust floats so slowly in the sunset, sunlight, so sunny and so precarious. Yes. <laughs> and then she has the metaphor of dancers. Pina Bausch. The floor is so hard and the dancers are moving so quickly. How can they do this? This is dangerous. They are dancing for Pina Bausch. If Pina was lifted up in the air as a child, did she laugh? Or did it seem dangerous, very dangerous? Tragedies occur, she writes in the next piece. Yes? Tragedies occur. Robert Polidori went to New Orleans and photographed homes after the flood. His photographs are as beautiful as a grand opera, as heartbreaking as a tragic play, but they are not on a play, on an opera or a play. They are real. This was someone's home. Will it ever be all right? Will it ever be all right? Oof. And then, of course, she comes to... Uh, uh, Henri, uh, Henri's uh, Cartier Bresson's photograph that she, you know, that she paints. You know, wonderful. Thank you, Myra. Ah, and here are her, are her desserts. And then, of course, if something goes wrong, here is my advice, she says. Keep calm and carry on. Even if it's bleak, hoach, even if it's without strength. Ah, a word about the fence and the neighbor. It's a mess. Yes, I don't know what the organization of the book is. You know, he's all over the place. But hey, you know, look who's talking. But I just find, you know, every other page is so is is very rich, you know, with insight and idea. So you know, that's what I care about. So try reading it more, you know, you can open it at any page and just start reading a bit. And uh, if you can get a hold of, it's a much more simple presentation, so it's lacking in some of the richness and depth. But I think it's an important study that might open up for you, uh, for some of us. Levinas's Jewish thought, between Jerusalem and Athens. Again, the between, the between.